Thanks, Brian. All right, cheers. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first Innovation Festival Encore. Um, we're often asked what happened to those ideas from the Innovation Festival. So we have a wonderful crowd that joins us at the festival every year. And as you, if you've been, you'll know we work very hard to create things out of that out of that event and make sure that uh, we've got great ideas coming out. And that usually, you know, 50, 60 ideas are going to come out of any festival would be the average. Um, but people will then go, well, what, what happened to those? Where did they go? Did they ever come to fruition? And, you know, the reality is that uh, getting an idea to value um, is quite hard work and actually requires a lot of patience and persistence. And what we've observed over the years of doing our festival is it can often take two, three, even four years sometimes to get an idea to fruition. But uh, be assured that we work very hard at our innovation pipeline um, to make sure that we take those ideas and turn them into value. And so what we thought we'd do this year is try something out and offer you a little window in uh, just, uh, you know, a few months after the festival as to what's going on, what happened to those ideas out of the festival. So that's what this session is all about. We've actually got five of them. Um, so we've organised them into bubbles as we did at the festival itself. The first one's focused on water wonders. And that's uh, obviously this session today. And then we've got Customer Heroes coming up on the 7th of November, Enviro Warriors on the 11th, Awesome Assets on the 14th, and lastly, Smart Tech on the 18th of November. So a chance to look in on the bubble that you're interested in, or you can look at all of them uh, because we'll be recording all of these sessions. So um, like I said, a little window in on what's going on with the ideas. I think uh, before we, we get into that, just a quick recap on the festival itself and a thank you to all of you who took part in it. I thought it was amazing. It was great to be back in person and back at the race course and all of the atmosphere and the, and the magic that somehow is in the air when we convene there. So we had more than 2000 people joining us uh, from over 38 different sectors and from 33 different countries, leveraging the the digital inputs that we found uh, during the COVID years, let's just call them that, um, and, and we kept a bit of that in play. And so 33 different countries thrilled that we were able to maintain that. We had 600 different organisations participating and 600 NWG staff. And so I think, you know, those are really some great numbers uh, and things that we're, we're very proud of as we try and innovate from the outside in, you know, looking outside our sector and beyond our normal geographic boundaries, if you will, to bring some ideas in that can help us to solve some of these complex societal and environmental issues that we face. We had our first live excavation and um, we had our first cooked breakfast prepared by a robot at the festival from the uh, wonderful guys at Fox Dog Studios. I think that was, that was a, a brilliant exhibition of, of what you can do when you crowdsource things. Um, we had Origin No Dig uh, joining us at the festival as well, and uh, we had several demos of that. And I know taking some stakeholders around the site and, and giving them a chance to look at that, that caused a lot of excitement. And we're working with them to develop that technology ahead of full commercialization. And uh, several other things that, are, that have gone on. Um, a lot of ideas have been have attracted seed funding indeed, and are now moving and getting out of the blocks as we form the partnerships that will bring these ideas to life. And not all of them will succeed. Um, so uh, for, for if you've been us, around us for a while, you'll know our intended success rate is four out of 10. So we're comfortable with the fact that some of these experiments as we proceed with them will actually fail. Um, and we'll learn from those things. And sometimes again, we, we wake them up at some point in the future when you're just going, okay, the technology matured or the price points come to somewhere that makes it economically viable. Um, all of those things can happen. So we have a very active innovation pipeline that we manage. And so um, without further ado, then I'm now going to hand over to Angela, who's going to give you a bit of a of her view of where we are in terms of innovation in the water sector and how we're doing at Northumbrian Water overall. Angela. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here for this first encore session this morning, focusing on the world of water. 
and what a rich space it has been over the last six festivals that we've run. I think it's true to say that we've really had some brilliant examples of innovation that have come out of this particular, um, if, 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 that has actually come alive within the water space. So currently within our innovation pipeline, we have 24 live projects and these are worth potentially over 30 million pounds annually if they all come off. But as Nigel touched on, not everything will work. We are willing to take a little bit of a punt and try things out. So therefore, we we, we really uh, need the festival to really bring new ideas to life. And indeed, that's what it's done. So taking a little bit of a look back over the years, some of the uh, ideas in this water space that have come to life is the treatment to tap project that we've been working on now for a good number of years with Siemens. And it actually started out in uh, in in 2020 when uh, Siemens managed to secure some seed funding to take that idea to the next stage. They then were successful in securing our InvestQuest funding to take it to that next stage further. And then indeed, we actually then took it really right to the top and got over £600,000 worth of off what funding to really bring this step change in water company, uh, water monitoring and proactive management to life. So we're really excited about how we've been able to develop that project over a number of different iterations and uh, bringing it into the place that it is today. So uh, really excited about that project, which is a Teesside uh, demonstration area that supplies over 90,000 customers. If I look back to the 2021 Innovation Festival, Morrison Water Services joined us at our hybrid event there and they hit the ground really quickly after the event with a data science model that has been operating uh, since March now 2022 and has really uh, been enabled us to actually identify uh, some uh, some leakage hotspots that we weren't able to identify previously. And we've done an awful lot of work in leakage over this last little while. So it's actually not it's really hard now to move that dial because actually we've we've made some really good gains. But this particular digital twin has enabled us to um, to increase our um, our our leakage reporting by a massive 25 percent. So we've actually been able to reduce by 25 percent, which is absolutely incredible in uh, in one of our, uh, our high leakage areas. So really excited by what we've done uh, with that particular project. And, and, that, and again, that one was really exciting because we were able to move that one really fast, which is something that uh, sometimes we struggle to do. Another exciting one coming from the 2019 Innovation Festival uh, was around problematic DMAs where Invenio successfully trialled uh, their temperature sensors, which uh, can estimate flow going into each property so we can properly calculate their consumption profile. Uh, so this is really helping us get a much more accurate consumption model. So then we're not, um, so we don't underestimate uh, customer night usage. And that trial has worked incredibly well. And again, is one of the ones that we've worked on from the festival. Uh, in the 2019 festival, we worked with Andrew Turner Innovations on his LaySafe trailer. So this was a health and safety issue that was identified with coiled 180 mil pipe, uh, caused some significant issues to the public and also to our, uh, to also people who work in the um, utilities business with the recoil of those pipes when they're actually released from a trailer. But what he's been able to do is actually been able to create a device that can be retrofitted onto trailers and can um, take out that uh, that kinetic energy. So then it can be laid very safely and also very quickly. So there's a real gain in terms of the um, time to actually lay pipe. It, the the actual incident itself in 2019 caused us not to be able to use that particular method for laying pipe. So then we were having to go to actually laying sticks of pipe and, and welding them together. And those are potential future leaks, which we really don't want to have. So actually going back to coil pipes is, is a much preferential way of, uh, of laying pipes for the future. So that's a, a brilliant innovation working with Andrew that is now going to be commercially available. And then on top of all of that, 
We've also been able to secure over £6 million, uh, for, again, from the Ofwat funding to actually establish a national leakage test and research centre, which is going to be a real game changer for the whole water sector because it's going to be, be able to speed up the way in which we, uh, we can work with suppliers to actually qualify innovations in this space, which we really very much need to do, and also speed up uh, things like the Regulation 31 uh, and that sort of uh, potential barrier to getting these really vital innovations into our um, business as usual as fast as we can. So a huge amount of work has gone on, really, really exciting. So what we're going to run through now for the rest of the rest of this session is really looking at how we can um, learn from what's going on in the current um, uh, from the festival of 2022. And we've got some absolutely brilliant speakers with us today that are going to just share what they've been doing in in their work. Uh, we we'll also invite questions, so if you have got any questions from what you hear today, please do use the chat function. It is there, so then you can actually um, ask live what's going on, or indeed, if it prompts any thoughts or ideas, please do get in touch and we'll answer your question after, uh, after the event. So without further ado, we're going to um, move to to Joe Wilkins, who is going to be uh, sharing um, all of the news on flush with data. So over to Joe. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I was involved in the flush with data sprint, um, which was a spin, sprint around data, but with perhaps a slightly different focus because this one focused on the data that we have available at our water treatment works. So instead of perhaps using customer data or leakage data, and network data, it was a great opportunity to get the sort of water supply teams and operational teams involved. Um, this sprint was actually held down in, in Essex on our Hanningfield Water Treatment Works site. So it gave the sort of operators a chance to um, get involved in perhaps where they can't travel, um, you know, and leave their site for too long. So our, our focus was looking at what could we use the water quality, the sort of data we get on a treatment works to improve the treatment works performance and our water quality performance. And how could we perhaps use that data to make better decisions? So we started off with a tour of the treatment works, which was great because we had a wide range of, of people join our sprint. Um, we had external partners of so people from Microsoft and Arup joined, um, you know, and people from other areas of the business. So we started with a tour of the treatment works. And then what we established is we seem to have lots of data, but perhaps lack knowledge and information. So it's turning that data into something that we can use. So we reviewed what data we had. Um, we split into sort of three main groups and sort of discussed the problems that we have on a treatment works. Um, so we 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 looked at um, filter washing, and that seems that's a main part of a treatment works process is how you manage and wash filters. Um, Hanningfield particularly is a large reservoir source and suffers from quite significant algal blooms. So is there any data we could have around that? Um, and the other one was was the sort of area I got involved in, which was the date, what we called a data reservoir. We're all about water, so it had to have a reservoir name. Um, so we had all these multiple sources of data. We've got um, lab data, so our, our sampling teams um, take a large amount of operational and compliance and regulatory data from the treatment works. We have lots of online monitors and all that's increasing. The number of monitors we're getting is increasing. And then the site teams have their own little mini labs where they do lots of checks. But none of that data is together. They're all it's all in different systems. Some of it's even still on paper. So what we looked at is the idea of, of pulling all that data into a data reservoir. Um, and even in the process of doing this, we discovered that half the trouble is getting the data out of the system. So it, it sort of highlighted the need for this. Um, so we were looking at, at, at processing all that data into a data reservoir that we could use and that then losing some kind of dashboard or reporting tool to pull that data out to give us visibility of that data. So it would give us benefits of, you know, being able to have more confidence by comparing the data streams, confidence in our online monitors compared to manual results. Um, could it give us more um, information on predictive maintenance for monitors, you know, when monitors weren't performing based, you know, by validating them against other results. Um, so that's sort of where, where we got to with, with that. Um, and I was just amazed with um, the teams involved at almost building demos and and you know prototypes within those sort of couple of days to actually demonstrate that we could do this. 
Um, the other thing that was a sort of a, a sideline that came out was perhaps um, because I said that the lab, the site teams do mini lab sort of data and work. A lot of that's still written on paper. Some of it goes into another system, but not all of it. So could we develop a, an app, a company wide app that the mini lab, the data just gets entered onto the app and automatically goes in a system, which give everybody much more clearer visibility of that data. Some of the other teams working on on things that we think would then fit perhaps on top of that data reservoir platform. So um, they call themselves Blooming Hex. So that was around algal blooms. Um, and that's using the data we've got as a predictive model to try and predict when we would or could get an algal bloom in the reservoir to allow the treatment works to prepare. Um, so they'd use a range of data, not just water quality data, but you know weather data, wind direction, sunlight levels, all things that impact an algal bloom. Um, another group worked on what they called a backwash predictor. So this was around the filter management and filter performance. Could we use an algorithm, use that data and algorithm to predict when the filters needed to wash? And therefore that could be quite a significant efficiency drive. Normally they wash either you know, on a set time every 48 hours or every 76 hours, but if the water quality is good, they might not need to wash that often. So could, could we sort of use the data and, and on the filter performance to work out when and how much they those filters needed to wash. Um, so that's where we got we got to. Um, all three ideas were were brilliant um, and they all sort of probably build on on each other. Um, but that that way of pulling all the different data from different sources together was the main sort of output of our sprint. That's brilliant. It's really good to hear uh, just what some really focused and dedicated time exploring uh, a different topic can uh, can really do. So it sounds like you had a, a really productive week. Yours was the uh, was the company first of actually doing the sprint actually at the mm -hmm. uh, at the treatment works. So what was that like? What was that experience uh, like during that week? And it was great. Um, it, I think I wrote down for something that's went well was was the people and the range of people that we had because, you know, we can't all travel to the to the northeast um, for those based in Essex and Suffolk and even those operational teams on treatment works, you know, can't necessarily take significant amounts of time away. But, you know, by actually being on the treatment works and with the treatment works operators that, you know, the range of sort of people we had and the um, enthusiasm of everybody was just really key. That's really good to hear and I think that that's definitely something that we want to build on for future festivals is actually being able being inclusive to actually have uh, the ability to have all sorts of um, different people part of the sprints, people who perhaps ordinarily wouldn't be able to get involved. So it sounded like that was, uh, as you say, one of the, the real successes of, of this particular sprint, which is really, really good to hear. So how are you taking some of these ideas forward? Well, that's probably where we have come a little bit unstuck. So, um, of, and I guess that's the difficulty with the operational teams is that we had a very busy summer. So I'd, um, don't think we've really progressed very far. I think everybody is is keen to, and maybe where I, I need to come to Nigel because it's sort of an IS type solution. So I might need Nigel's help. But um yeah, it that's what that's probably the difficult thing is is the, you know, on the day we 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 got what we needed. We had some really great enthusiasm, but it's finding that it's it's the time and finding that after the sprint to take those further those for, further forward. I, to I do totally empathise and as you rightly point out, we did have as a business a, a very challenging summer. So uh, so it's not surprising that perhaps uh, this got put on the back burner a little bit. But you know what? The great thing is, is that uh, that this op this conversation has given us an opportunity to flag that, yes, perhaps a little bit of help and support is needed to, uh, to nudge those great ideas that you had forward. So we'd be very much up for hearing about what help we can uh, support apply in order to uh, to accelerate those ideas forward a little bit further. Hopefully we're in for a nice run during this winter, <laughs> so fingers crossed. Yes, that would be great.
Fantastic. So we'll definitely be in touch to uh, to see how we can uh, help and and support those ideas moving forward. But it sounds like overall, uh, you know, a, a really brilliant start and some really, uh, you know, very rich places for us to look to find some efficiencies and to improve how we do things. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, thank you very much and thank you everybody who was part of that flush with with data sprint sounds like uh, an absolutely uh, fantastic sprint. So without further ado, we're going to stay in the uh, in, in the Essex and Suffolk region and we're going to move over now uh, to Luke Stockdale, who's going to share with us what went on in his stop the clock sprint. Thank you, Angela. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I was I was a co-lead on our on our stop the clock sprint, which was looking at um, how we can improve our already already industry leading performance in um, customer supply interruptions. Um, obviously, it's a really really difficult subject because we are already doing so well in 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 the wider industry. Um, we have been for the past few years, but how can we actually? improve upon that even more and obviously our regulatory targets for this measure um, they're not standing still you know off what are, are, are slowly reducing those um, those targets accordingly um, so it is proving more and more difficult for us to to reach those targets so what we wanted to do was um, really set the scene around you know what current processes have allowed us to achieve up to up to now um, but also with regards to the um, the financial reward and penalty mechanism as well we we had quite a large um, operational influence within our within our sprint um, sprint group um, which is fantastic we had also um, uh, a couple of people, a smattering of people from external companies, from um, um, other sort of data led um, consultants as well. But it was very much largely driven by our own operational staff, which was deliberate because we felt that they were there at the coalface. They want to have an input into how they can improve their performance in order to uh, for us to re continuously reach our targets every year. Um, so the first day, as I said, was, was really then setting the scene around, you know, what we've done up to now. Um, all of our uh, attendees learned how um, our performance driven finances can actually swing anywhere between 10 million pounds in regulatory reward, right up to 18 million pounds in, in regulatory penalty as well. Roughly works about to 49,000 pounds difference for every second that we add to that interruptions to supply performance. So considerable amounts of money just based on, you know, small small amounts of time. Um, there's large, large amounts of discussion around the pressures about, you know, obviously keeping that interruption time down for customers, um, largely under the three hour mark. Um, but also, you know, the, the additional constraints to that. So, you know, it's not just this interruption measure that we're um, we're looking at. It's about um, reducing the number of burst mains as well. That feeds into that, the amount of leakage that is coming um, as a result of that interruption as well. Um, and then we also had a demonstration of um, what's called the MOBI that's been well documented over, over the company over the last few months and how successful that has been. So it's essentially a mobile, um, a glorified water tank, I suppose. It's a pressurized water tank that that is um, portable. Um, and we use those to enable us to uh, maintain supplies for customers. And therefore, um, those customers would not um, be included into this interruption to supply measure. Um, and obviously reducing the time where a customer, you know, before the MOBI was available might be um, interrupted uh, for three hours we might have reduced that to an hour so fantastic customer service all around there and that really then um, helped um, us move into day two where um, our, our groups were expected to put more meat on the bones um, around ideas um, and we were to judge each individual idea of um, you know how how uh, people felt that we could improve upon that 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 performance and reducing that um, interruption time um, as as much as possible. And we probably are talking about the marginal gains here. You know, it's not like um, leakage, for example, where we know we have a, um, a quite a way to go to achieve um, a performance commitment target. And this is all about the marginal gains because we are so good at um, our, our interruptions to supply um, performance so far. Um, 
and what we had was we had four fantastic um, ideas, um, but all with similar underlying themes. So like Joe mentioned earlier, um, all four of our ideas are very, very much intertwined and so much so that um, yes, we did judge each each idea individually. There was an individual winner at the end of the second day as well in terms of the idea, but actually what we said was we wanted to take all four ideas forward as well because we each felt that um, the, the 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 gains the benefits from each idea would would be would be um, significant by themselves but even more significant as a collective and and they really fed in to each other nicely um, those four ideas three of them were largely operational um, and, and one was data led um, the data led idea um, it was essentially uh, an app or a dashboard that all employees, all relevant stakeholders interested in the interruptions to supply can actually use um, live to see how long each event has been running for from the moment that interruption begins, um, each stage of a, of, a, of a resolution, you know, where we are with a fix, a lot along the lines of um, how our leakage portal um, is, is providing information both internally and externally to us, you know, each stage of, of a repair and, and, and the effect that has on our overall interruptions to supply performance and ultimately that could then end up being a customer service mechanism in the future as well so fantastic um, potential there and then the three I suppose more simple ideas and I'm not saying that in a you know in, in, a, in a negative way you know the best innovations are the most simple ones so um, you know these are things that potentially we could start to get off the ground very very quickly um, the first one of those would be to utilize existing um, water company sites so th um, areas like water towers reservoirs you know that are secure um, but we may just have a, um, a storage container in there to store relevant fittings equipment barriers more local to certain jobs to reduce that amount of time traveling or you know the the um, the amount of time spent planning the, the logistical element of um of a certain job um you know it might be that an hour is spent of that potential three hour interruption just traveling backwards and forwards from a certain site gathering relevant materials um if there was a closer satellite site nearby that can reduce that time by half then that's you know that's going to be uh, a massive benefit in in itself um, the second operational idea was having um, within a, a, a two man um, DMO crew that actually digs the holes and repairs, um, repairs our assets. We'd actually um, have a third man in, in, in that DMO crew that would be deployed to actually answer any customer contact and, and act as like a liaison officer between, um, you know, the office and the field. Um, and what that will allow us to do is it allows the crew to then solely focus on their job of repairing that main as efficiently as possible and optimizing the amount of time that it takes. Um, a lot of the guys that we had in, in our group actually said on average, customers coming up to the crew um, interrupting their work and asking um, when are they going to be finished, for example. On average, it takes around 45 to 50 minutes of their time on site. So a, a significant proportion of of um, that potential interruption time. Um, so obviously that third that third person in 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 that situation would would allow um, would, would hopefully take that element that that forty five minute um, delay away from that um, overall interruption. And the third operational idea was um, for our leakage technicians to get involved in in you know whenever they're actively surveying an area for, for leaks you know they're they're, they're sounding on um, valves and, and lifting valve covers and things like that they're actually proactively identifying valves of concern so so you know act, when the time comes for um, there being an interruption in that certain area a lot of time again is spent cleaning valves out that, that perhaps are not um, immediately operational you know there's a lot of time there um clearing them out of debris and, and chambers out of debris and and, um, and dirt and things like that to actually enable the operation of the valve if there is a, an identification process where you know we do have leakage technicians actively checking these valves anyway it could be utilizing existing technology that we have already so like the gis collector app for example marking them on that collector app identifying that 
that actually that that valve needs a particular um, cleaning mechanism or, or, or something like that. It just helps um, maintain our assets more effectively. Um, and again, it just ultimately reduces that time spent in just um, you know not not needing to clean a valve when it's immediately required you know when that clock is already ticking so it's just about making that process more efficient um in terms of of, of how we've progressed those four ideas um very much along the same lines as, as what joe has mentioned you know the summer that we've had has been very, very, very challenging um, in respect to burst mains, in respect to interruption performance. You know, it has dropped off recently. So obviously this is still very, very much um, an, an important thing that we need to do. And also the focus on leakage that we've had as well, the focus on drought restrictions, obviously feeding into, um, you know, the ITS and, and um, the ITS performance and the whole um, customer perception, external perception of that as well. Um, we haven't been in a position to progress any of those ideas as, as quickly as we would like. The operational um, ideas are obviously some of that that we can look at fairly quickly. I think we should be in a position actually to take a couple of those forward uh, within the next month or so, I would like to think. The data led idea of the app obviously needs a little bit more work, but I think we can we can look to um, progress that and, and certainly get into a position where we can share more certainly by the end of the year. Um, but there's no real data and um, no real detail, unfortunately, as to how we've progressed, um, I'm, I'm afraid. But but we are we are confident in in terms of what we can do. Um, certainly by the end of the year to, to actually uh, move forward with, with each of those four ideas. Thanks for that, Luke. Uh, it sounds like your sprint really identified some really, really good insights that are indeed very actionable. Uh, so, uh, so as you outlined, um, a challenging summer, but hopefully now uh, we'll have a little bit of a run where you can actually then uh, implement some of these and, and put them uh, into operation to, to really save those vital seconds and minutes that uh, that really do uh, make all the difference with regards to uh, to the uh, the reward situation. We've also had a, a question in the chat there, somebody saying that they'd love to know more about Moby. Uh, and indeed, this has been, um, I love the passion that is in your team anyway. Um, and, uh, and Moby was one of those brilliant um, innovations that was inspired uh, from one of your staff at a, at a trade show. And he really has shown such dedication to getting that particular innovation up and running. So maybe you want to just say a few minutes about that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can I can put in um, I can I can share a link as well um, to 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 the basis of that. But yes, that's, that's right. It has it has stemmed from um, a, a previous idea innovation that essentially started as a as a pressurized tank within a wheelie bin. Um, we, we, with some pipe work coming off it, and and what that allows, what that allowed us to do was to, um, you know, something portable that can maintain supplies rather than connecting um, what's called an overland rider to to, to hydrants or, or washouts on our own network. We can actually connect these portable tanks directly to the customer's property. So it might be even, you know, in, in more rural um, areas, these would be worth their weight in gold because, you know, we can't always reach every single customer based on the topography of the of the land or, or, or the way that the network is set up with regards to pressure. Um, having, you know, a customer having its own tank i suppose its own individual supply has helped us reduce the number of properties that have um, encountered an interruption to supply and ultimately uh, it improves our performance as well um, that that wheelie bin has now evolved um, into a, a more um, uh, rugged um, weatherproof i suppose if you like um, sort of shell um, it's, it's a lot easier to, to transport on the back of a of a trailer, um, just more refined and more um, more um, accessible, I suppose. And we do have a large number of these now within the business and we've shared internally the successes of, 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 of the Moby. Um, you know, reducing uh, uh, the, the minutes lost to, 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 to interruptions. And obviously from a customer service perspective as well, you know, 
for for an Essex and Suffolk water, a Northumbrian water van to turn up with their own personal supply almost. You know, for me, I, you know, if I, if I experienced that as a customer, I would be very, very impressed um, to, you know, and felt that I was being looked after and cared for from a, from a customer service aspect. So, um, yeah, it's been so, supremely beneficial um, for us. Um, and it's, it's a prime example of what we can do when we do work with external companies and, and um, innovative ideas that, again, aren't, you know, hugely technologically advanced, but actually it's the more simple ideas that, you know, we can adapt to our own situation and, you um, you know, at the end of the day, we now have a product that we use um, fairly regularly. You know, I would probably say pretty much every day. Yeah, no, I can see in Yammer that the Mobis are being used uh, used uh, a lot now, which is really, really good to see. So that little bit of seed funding investment that we gave many years ago uh, is really uh, bearing some fruit, which is brilliant to see. So thank you very much for that update. And uh, I wish you well with uh, bringing those ideas uh, to life. So now we are now going to switch gears and we're going to move over to uh, Eleanor Clement from uh, from Ordnance Survey, who's going to tell us more a little about an inspector call sprint. Over to you, Eleanor. Hi, thank you, Angela. So um, I was at the Innovation Festival, like Angela said, with Ordnance Survey alongside our, some of our sister companies, so uh, Geoplace and Geovation, uh, where we were working on the an inspector calls sprint which was with the water regulations teams at Northumbrian and some other water companies um so this is a team that are responsible for organizing inspectors to go out to organizations particularly high priority ones and just inspecting those to ensure that the water supply is not being contaminated and is safe to drink for everyone so really vital work but work that you don't really often hear about or consider so much but they're doing such an important job so it was really great to get to work with them so in terms of an inspectacles, the sprint itself, we started off with a kind of deep dive into the current process. So we were really lucky at the sprint to get people from a range of water companies there. So from Northumbrian as well as other water companies um, who worked both in those water regulations teams and in other teams as well, um, as well as some other kind of non water companies as well, such as retailers. So in order to bring everyone up to the same page I guess we uh, had some good activities looking at the kind of work the inspectors do which was really uh, eye-opening for me especially because I obviously I don't come from a water background at all um, so getting to look at the kind of contraventions that inspectors find was interesting and quite gross so <laughs> that was that was a good activity. Um, we kind of then did a deep dive into the process that exists currently both at Northumbrian and other water companies. So looking at how do we currently kind of collate the data that tells inspectors where to visit um, and what are the key pain points here. So when we were looking at the pain points and prioritising them, it consistently came back and back to data. So looking at the quality of the data, so quite often the data was very out of date. So the data often that these teams have to use is up to six years old. So, for example, if you're kind of trying to organise an inspection on six year old data, it's quite often you'll turn up at the address and either it's got a completely different purpose now. So you go expecting a restaurant and it's now something completely different or it may have changed ownership. So trying to get in contact with the people who are at these addresses in order to organise these inspections can be really hard and really time consuming. So these were kind of the main pain points uh, and when we were solutionising obviously it's up to data. So this is where I think that we can make the most difference and obviously as I'm here from Honor Survey that's somewhere we can really help. Um, so since the sprint we've uh, been really lucky to get some Kickstarter funding to continue this work with the WaterX team at Northumbrian. So we've recently had our kind of kickoff session with Northumbrian and Ordnance Survey and we're hoping to come up and visit you guys as soon as we can. Um, so we're hoping to kind of do an even deeper dive than we did at the sprint. So looking at each stage of the process kind of from start to finish. So collecting that data, kind of creating the jobs, prioritising the visits, contacting the people at the uh, kind of organisations by phone, um, organising them and then actually doing the inspections themselves. So looking at each stage of that and seeing where can we kind of increase efficiency with better data. It was also really interesting at the festival to hear that the teams at quite a lot of the water companies weren't aware that they already licensed high quality addressing data from us that they could be using instead. So, for example, address based premium, um, which is provided by Ornate Survey, is um, kind of a high quality 
up to date addressing data set that would uh, cause that would uh, solve a lot of I think the pain points. So we're kind of looking at how we can maybe bring in the insights that we can gain from this alongside the uh, addressing data that's already being used by the team and see how we can bring that into kind of improve efficiency and streamline um, as well as looking at kind of other insights from addressing products such as points of interest data to look at classification of these addresses so that high priority addresses are definitely being visited first. Um, another issue that was kind of focused on at the uh, Innovation Festival was contacting um, contacting these organisations. So we did a really interesting, uh, I guess, activity on the second day, I think it was, where we were given a list of addresses that had recently come to the water regulations team. So this was the exact addresses that they were using. And all it had was kind of just the address. And we were all given it and told, OK, go find out what kind of organisation this is, what the contact details are, who's there and what kind of fluid category or risk category this is. Um, and with the data that we were given that was quite often quite old, uh, this was very difficult to do. So bringing in any additional insights that we can in terms of contact details, in terms of the kind of organisation at that address is really valuable as well. Um, so I guess to kind of sum it up, the three main areas we're looking at moving forward with the team is first of all that kind of original data source. So making sure that the data they're getting to use is up to date um, and it's kind of high quality. Looking at the job creation itself, so prioritising which visits to do first and looking at high priority versus low priority um, addresses. And then the kind of field visit themselves. So what information do the inspectors need when they're out in the field? And is there a way that we can kind of create a sort of feedback loop where if they see a change in an address, which they often do, um, can we capture that and can we kind of improve the data set even more? So that in future visits, we know that, for example, this address has changed ownership or it has changed type. Um, I guess the last thing to say is in terms of actual uh, tangible changes from the festival, the team have been great in that they've really made quite well a couple of weeks. So into the work that we're doing with them, they gained some really um, useful insights through the festival, for example, feedback on how they word the letters that they send out before they do inspections. So they were told that maybe they could soften the language that they used and also highlight that the water inspections that they provide are free. And um, so they've made these changes and found that they've actually got quite increased engagement from the customers as a result. So that's kind of a real world change that's managed to be implemented already. So yeah, looking forward to making more of those. So it's been really good so far. That's a really good update. Thank you very much, Eleanor. And I think that this one was a really exciting sprint because it actually came from the business. So somebody reached out to the team uh, after one of the leadership conferences saying, we've got this issue. Is there any way that you can help us? And then after conversations, it actually then became a sprint at the festival, which has actually borne fruit, which is it's just incredible. So just to put that into a bit of perspective, they currently spend about 40 percent on their of their budget amending data. So imagine if they don't have to do that and you're well on the way to helping them really uh, get those efficiencies which uh, is really really uh, brilliant to hear so uh, so thank you very much for that update uh, brilliant insights and great that uh, already activity is happening in that particular space so uh, looking forward to seeing more from that so now uh, we're going to be moving over to uh, to Alan Brown, who's going to share the uh, the progress that's happened in the water quality sprint that happened at the festival. Hey, good morning, Angelo. Good morning, everybody else. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the managing water quality risk sprint, a systems approach. So this is we did this with the uh, Business Modeling Associates uh, (BMA), more commonly known. We're currently doing a kind of a pilot. Um, work with them at the moment, essentially looking at disinfection six systems across six water treatment works. And what their modeling is allowing us to do is kind of look at the individual component fails within a disinfection system and understand how many failure modes that that actually generates at, at that treatment works. Um, you know, depending on the complexity of the of the site that could kind of create uh, hundreds, if not thousands of scenarios. Um, so, you know, the modeling is kind of quite powerful and allow us to understand, I suppose, the level of risk, potential risk each site face, faces based on it, sort of each failure mode and helps us understand kind of the opportunities uh, for improvement or, ed or indeed mitigation. Um, but then we started as, we, as we're kind of doing the planning and scheduling for that, that pilot work, we got into conversations, with the BMA and said, actually, you know, disinfection is 
essentially one small subset of overall uh, drinking water quality management and control. You kind of you look at the source to tap uh, approach uh, to drinking water. You know, there's many physical systems there, business processes, multiple teams, and departments. You know, all kind of interdependent, and kind of all of those come together to be able to create kind of safe, clean drinking water for the customers. And this kind of level of uncertainty uh, it needs to be assessed and understood and managed. And essentially, this is we do this through what's called drinking water safety plans, which is a, a risk management approach, I say, cross source to tap, uh, which is currently done by a couple of people in the water quality team. But to kind of give you some context, the, the number of kind of lines of risk assessment kind of hit almost like 300,000 alone just in the kind of Northumbrian water. So it's quite significant and quite a manual task. So I so said we got into conversations with the BMA of how we could approach this and maybe expand the work we're doing in this pilot phase around disinfection systems. Um, it was it was a bit of a challenge. Um, it was probably the last one to get through the door in terms of a sprint. We had about three or four weeks to pull it together, but you know, um, that, that never never want to kind of let those things get in our way. And I think we kind of did an excellent job in the end of getting um, real buy-in from across the industry. Um, uh, you know, and got some key contributors throughout the sort of three days of the sprint. And I think kind of essentially we were really pleased with the outcome um, and, and what we achieved. So as I say, we talked about those lines of risk assessment data. They can essentially sit on our Maximo system at the moment. Um, and so for the sprint was kind of thinking about how we could use those existing data streams on existing systems and almost build uh, sort of use the latest systems thinking and build an adaptive risk management capability which kind of streamlines or makes more efficient, much simpler way of kind of assessing the complexity of drinking water and then creates kind of new insights, better decision making and improved performance around that. Um, we kind of split the, the, the sprint into four key themes really, um, all kind of interdependent with each other, but kind of critical layers to what we're trying to achieve. The first was kind of looking at data. Um, understanding kind of what data streams existed, what uh, how we'd increase better awareness and utilization of data sets, and also kind of linking those data sets together. We looked at the process, so that's the integration of drinking water safety plans and the administration of it uh, with other business processes, which kind of influence the kind of the control measures we put in place. At a system level, um, you know, kind of how can the analytics kind of articulate the risk whether it's at a site level, whether a regional level, at a company level, so we can understand, you know, where we actually sit on that kind of water water quality risk curve, and kind of understand the various levels across the business, how we kind of influence the short, medium, and long term outcomes around water quality. And the fourth aspect, and probably as critical as anything else, was around the people. So kind of making sure that that change management aspect uh, was definitely uh, understood, get under the skin of that. And make sure that anything we put in place, you know, around analytical developments, um, were kind of in line with it, kind of the user experience that we wanted to provide. Um, so we created a number of user pro profiles across the sprint, uh, just to kind of test that user experience and see what value and insight we could gain from it. Um, so you know, when I talked about Maximo earlier, where the risk assessments kind of carried out there, that's if you mentioned. Imagine kind of that's our system of records is kind of a high level of governance that sits around it. And what we're almost trying to look here is kind of an agile sort of low governance, advanced analytical uh, capability, which kind of sits above those core kind of commoditized processes such as Maximo and GIS. Um, and in this instance, you know, uh, using that, using kind of taking the user profile in, in that way, we kind of, if you're a treatment works manager uh, or an operator, um, you would kind of use this these analytics to kind of toggle between the assets and the controls that you have on site and determine whether you kind of you, if you've got a piece of planned act or even reactive activity what would be the increased level of risk drink linked to the drink or to safety plans risk assessment for actually taking a component out or doing that piece of work and that kind of allows us to have a much more comprehensive sort of scenario analysis, whether we sort of make decisions on go or no go on any particular piece of work or whether we can kind of live with that increased level of risk. It kind of provides the operational teams with a lot more leverage in terms of raising issues to kind of the maintenance teams, to the tactical planning teams, uh, based on that kind of that level of risk and mitigation required. And provide some real time reporting or linkage through to the drinking water safety plan team, uh, almost kind of operationalizing what we do. So imagine kind of 
it's it's managed by these two people and yes they talk across the business but actually we want it to become a real experience for the operational teams as well they engage with water safety plans and understand how it influences what they do on a day-to-day -day. and also importantly when we talk look at kind of those 300,000 or so risks actually a vast majority of them are relatively static you know we probably wouldn't go near them unless unless we're kind of doing a five-year refresh really using the analytics to focus on those 10 to 20 percent of the risks which are material and which potentially can change on a day-to-day -day basis so that's kind of what, what we were trying to focus on in terms of the outcome you know i think the first base is we have to complete the kind of the, this pilot work on disinfection systems with bma but what we think we've created now is kind of a roadmap from that on the assumption that that's proved successful and we can demonstrate the value we've got almost a 12-month roadmap of how roadmap of how we extend that out um, and ultimately get to a point where we can incorporate kind of the, this broader thinking around drinking water safety plan so really the output is around what's next and what can we achieve over a 12-month period and i think you know that ultimate end game is this end-to-end -end capability um, which we think has, has got some real leverage around the off what breakthrough challenge is a contender which Angela kind of mentioned at the at the outset there and how successful the water team's been. You know, I think this is another opportunity to do that. And the reason kind of why I'm thinking that is because I said we've got some great buy-in from a number of other water companies who kind of face exactly the same challenges and just kind of trying to lift water safety plans from in let's say a pseudo spreadsheet into something that kind of is real and, and within each company. And you know this kind of will be a, a bit of a disruptor if you like um with across the industry but you know the, the i think the, the importance here is we've got a number of advocates within in the sector who, who are happy to kind of keep this momentum going and we're going to we've created a working group to allow us to do that and the other aspect is getting all the regulators on board you know part of drinking water safety plans is you have to kind of your, your summary risk kind of set is sent off to the deed of why as part of sort of regular monthly or annual uh, sort of uh, submissions uh, we're hoping to get a, a conversation with Marcus Rink, the Chief Inspector of the DWI, actually in the next few weeks, take him through the, the work we're doing on disinfection systems and how we want to expand that out into drinking water safety plans. And I think we can get the likes of Marcus on side. That'll be kind of a, a real game changer for us in terms of taking this, this whole project forward. So essentially the, out, the output is more the roadmap and what we can do. And I think it's just kind of the art of the possible. Sounds like a very productive sprint, even if it was uh, last in through the doors. It sounds like uh, you had a very productive week and I would love to see uh, what you can do to actually bring that to life and to uh, to bring it forward, especially if it is through the off what route where we have uh, where we have quite a bit of experience now in the business. So we'd be very happy to help uh, help see what what is possible there. So now we are over to uh, our last update, uh, last uh, but no, right, but um, uh, so it's with uh, Claire Gowdy, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the Thames No Dig uh, sprint that happened at the festival in the summer. Uh, a very exciting one for us because, again, it was another festival first in that Thames actually led this sprint, uh, which is something that uh, we haven't had another water company do before. So, uh, so very exciting. So over to you, Claire, to share a little bit more about what happened in your sprint. Uh, yeah, we were in a hybrid sprint uh, for Thames Water, um, looking at uh, reviewing an off what bid they'd put in previously, but had been unsuccessful. So the aim of the uh, sprint was to look at what they were proposing and get some external views on it to try and make uh, any future bids better. So um, it worked quite well because we had a facilitator in the room and a facilitator for those join us online. Um, but we had some challenging moments because they were working on um, Miro and obviously we had our boards in the room. So trying to transfer the information between the two took uh, a bit of effort, but uh, we got quite a good outcome in the end and they took away quite a lot of stuff to work on to um, help improve their future bridge. Some of it validated what they'd already thought, but they did get some new ideas from some suppliers that they'd not come across or worked with before. So uh, they seem quite pleased with the outputs from that point of view that they, it was going to allow them to take the thing, uh, the um, idea forward. 
Uh, we obviously took the people out to see the no dig demos that Nigel mentioned at the start of, of the session, um, as it was something they'd not seen before, um, that specific technology and how we'd managed to make that work. Um, so going forward, they're not submitting into this current round of off what funds this autumn, but they have managed to secure some internal funding that is going to be matched by uh, TRL uh, Transport for London um, funding because for their lane rental charges that they have to pay for working in London, they can actually apply for funding for research to help improve that. So obviously the output for this project uh, will help reduce congestion in London, which was one of the main points of it. So they're going to spend the next sort of nine months using that funding to address some of the questions raised by Offwatch using the information that they gained from the sprint um, and the discussions that we had over the three days um, with a view to hopefully putting in a better bid in 2023 to the Offwatch fund, having done the, uh, the initial work that was suggested by Offwatch over the next nine months. Cool. So as uh, as you highlighted at the start, uh, you were very brave and took on uh, a hybrid sprint, which is only for the brave, uh, because uh, since um, we've been a fully digital hybrid and then back uh, being in person, we absolutely want to keep the digital aspect of the event, but actually doing that in a hybrid way. I think uh, we're all wrestling with to see how we can crack that little number. So all of the feedback and insights that you have from doing that are going to be really valuable for us actually strengthening that arm of the festival moving forward, which is brilliant. Also very exciting to actually have worked with Thames uh, at the festival and and pass on our knowledge and expertise to their team, which I know that they very much appreciated and uh, and valued being part of the festival. So uh, so excellent to hear that the uh, that our festival has impacted work that's going on in London. So uh, so that's uh, that's very positive news. So thank you very much for that update. And indeed, thank you very much to all of our speakers that we've had on this morning. Absolutely brilliant to hear about uh, what went on in your sprints, uh, to hear about the big ideas that have come out and also to get some insight in terms of what we can expect to see from you over the next uh, nine months or so uh, and as we bring some of these insights to life and really make a difference to our business which is why we run the festival to be able to make these changes and interventions to make what we do even better. So we had a question in the chat there. Um, uh, when is Innovation Festival uh, 2023? So indeed it is on the calendar now. So please don't go on holiday the week of the 10th of July 2023 when we will be uh, Innovation Festivaling again. Uh, in the meantime, you can sign up to our newsletter so you can keep up to date with all of the news out of all of the sprints, all of the other innovation work that we have going on at Northumbrian Water and indeed uh, updates as to what's happening at the festival next year. So you can uh, you can sign up to that that newsletter. Uh, and once again, just a, a huge thank you and I'll hand over to Nigel. Thank you, Angela, and thank you to all of our speakers. So a quick, a quick wrap from me, um, and uh, I was furiously scribbling notes here. So uh, flush with data, I think it's is great when you go out on site, isn't it? Was what struck me about that, and and um, you really understand and observe the problems that uh, the operators face in detail. Um, I guess I'm very keen to help out if I can on that one. A, f a couple of ideas struck me about how we use the data for predictive maintenance. Um, I guess anticipating when algae blooms are coming along and and if we can do something on filter washing um, related to energy efficiency, then um, obviously the payback of that could be could be quite significant given what's happening with energy prices. Um, stop the clock. Uh, I guess it was it was great to hear again about Moby and we, we see this one pop up at ELT quite often and it's brilliant little innovation I think a very simple one and I uh, fully echo um, the words of um, I can't remember if it was Luke or Andrew now but but one of you were saying there about how some of our best innovations are indeed not that technological and um, I think we've seen a few examples of those and those are the ones that really get me quite excited as well. Um, and, and you know some simple things there we can do the extra person in the crew so you know taking 40 or 50 minutes 
of effort off. Um, I think you know when you've got a large burst, that that could be uh, you know quite a significant gain. Um, and inspect the calls again. I think it was a, a really good to see an in-depth view of the process, and and getting people with different views, people who don't understand the process around a process like that. Um, not everything that comes out of the festival that we progress is indeed what we would refer to as an innovation. So some of the things that we do, um, a bit like this better use of, uh, of ordnance survey assets that we've already got, we would put in the continuous improvement bucket. Honestly, it doesn't matter. Um, as long as they're things that improve our business, then I think those, you know, it's all it's all good news. Um, I, I dropped in on the water quality sprint at the end and um, I don't know if I've ever seen Alan look quite so excited and, and, and you know, a, a, a lot of people looking very excited about dynamic risk assessment and it's quite staggering to, to, to see, you know, how much data is in play there. And uh, I think that focus on the 10 to 20 percent of that that's dynamic um, and taking a more advanced analytical approach could really pay dividends and make everybody's um, lives easier, I think, in, in, in that world. And then <clears throat> lovely to see that Thames Water stepped up and did a sprint with us and we're very open to, to more of that. So I'll just close by saying thank you again for your attention. Thank you to all of the speakers. Um, it isn't easy to move innovations along sometimes. Um, we did have a very hard summer. Um, just getting water out the door uh, really stretched our teams given that we had a, you know three months without any rain. So sometimes those things can get in the way of, of progress of some of these ideas. But uh, you know when we get when we get the chance, we get back to them and we do keep moving them along and we do fund them. Um, and it, it isn't easy, but uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the efforts of everybody within our organization and out with um, the partners in our ecosystem. So please stay tuned for, for more and thank you.